Then when you go to chapter 13, you have two more symbolic players. The beast out of the sea in verse 1 and the beast out of the earth in verse 11. The beast out of the sea is that person that we call elsewhere in the New Testament the Antichrist. The one who is opposed to Christ, the one who is in place of Christ, and yet interestingly, he's only called Antichrist, Antichristos in Greek, in John's letters. John calls him in the book of Revelation simply the beast. The beast who is at war with the lamb. And the lamb is going to triumph over the beast because he's not only the suffering lamb who died for our sins, he's the triumphal lamb who is destined to reign and rule as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The beast out of the sea he describes as the epitome of blasphemy. People get all hung up on the details. The ten horns, the seven heads, etc. No, look at what he looks like in verse 2. A leopard, a bear, a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. Well, where do you see those same words used? The book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Those represented human kingdoms. The lion of Babylon, the bear of Media Persia, or the leopard of Greece, the monster of Rome, etc. The Antichrist is the epitome of all human government that is opposed to God and the things of God, and he's empowered by who? The dragon. You have, in a sense, a kind of unholy trinity with a small t. The dragon, the devil, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet opposing the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God. And as he describes him, he says that God gives him power from Satan himself. The dragon empowers him. God allows it as his act of judgment on the unbelieving world. And there was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies in verse 5. And power was given to him for 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. Those dates are used throughout the book that he rises to power very slowly, apparently, during the first half of the seven years of tribulation, but by the midpoint, he's in full power. He slays the two witnesses. He's trying to stop the work of God. He is trying to rule the world by himself, and he makes war, in verse 7, with the saints. And all that dwelled on the earth, verse 8, shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life. Those that are not really saved are going to fall for the leadership, the authority, and the power of the Antichrist. Now, you may say to yourself, well, not me. No, if people disappear, I'll know they're after. Hey, if I'm left behind, man, I better get saved as quick as I can here, etc. If you won't come to Christ in a time of relative peace and prosperity, you think you're going to come to Christ when it's going to cost you your life and you're going to be martyred for your faith? No, if you won't live for him, you will never die for him. Don't kid yourself. You're as lost as a goat and you know it. The power of God is not evidenced in your life anywhere and you know that. You know that you don't have one iota of hope of ever standing in the presence of an all-holy God with all the things that have gone wrong in your life. You see, the only hope is all the things that went right when God sent Jesus into the world to take all our wrong on himself, all our evil deeds, all our terrible things on himself, and die in our place. That's the only payment that is sufficient for your sins for all eternity. And Jesus did that for you, and he bids you come to me now while there's hope, while there's time, before it is too late, because there's coming a time when it will be too late. And the Antichrist will deceive the world. And the Antichrist will rule in power and authority and eradicate anybody that stands against him. We've seen that kind of depravity in human leaders before. Whether it's a Hitler or a Stalin or a Pol Pot or some radical dictator out of control, humanity has this attitude, I want to be God. I want to rule. I want to be in charge. And if I have to eliminate God and the people of God and the things of God to get it done, I'll try to do it. So Satan tries to eliminate the idea of God from our thinking. Oh, surely there can't be a real divine personal God in a world that has evolved over billions and billions of years and you're just a little speck on the human scale. You don't really matter at all. And all of that thinking ultimately convinces us, let the leader be in charge. Let the media tell us what to believe or what to think or what to do, if the case may be. And the Antichrist will use all of that to his advantage one time to spin it in the direction he wants it to go and deceive the world. You see, how deceived are they going to be? Well, according to verse 11, he'll be assisted by a spiritual leader. There arose another beast out of the earth. And later in the book, he's clearly called the false prophet. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He spoke the message of Satan. No, he looked religious. He tried to act religious, but what he said was right from the heart of the devil himself. And he exercised all the power of the first beast. And he caused all that dwell on the earth to worship the beast, the Antichrist. He's trying to get your attention away from God, the God of the Bible, the God of truth, the God of heaven, to worship the beast and his power and his material success and glory. And they'll worship him, and if they don't, fire will come down and devour them. So he has some kind of miraculous ability. And then he 
ultimately, verse 14, deceives all of those that dwell on the earth. How? By the image of the beast. Some kind of projected imagery of some sort. Now, I don't know if it's a hologramic image. The facts of the Scripture in prophecy are clear. Jesus will come again. He will come to take a bride home to heaven. He will come to judge the earth, etc. Some of the details are a matter of interpretation. And beyond that, some are just a matter of speculation. And we have to understand that. Don't preach your speculations as though it were the facts. The facts are clear. He will empower some kind of image. I don't know if it's a statue, if it's a hologramic visual image. We are caught up in a culture that is obsessed with visual images, visual images that appear to be real. And that would seem to me to be a very plausible explanation of what would come here in the future. He can give life and power to the image, and it can speak and talk to you. A literal visual image that can talk to you, your phone can talk to you. Your computer can talk to you. That reality is already here. And then he caused all, both small and great, to receive a mark, the mark of the beast, in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, that word mark, literally in Greek, karagma, means a tattoo, technically, a cutting in the skin, a marking of some sort in the skin. And what is it? It's the mark, verse 17, of the beast, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. It is an insignia, it is a name, and it's a number. The computer card has all of that. The credit card has all of that. In other words, the icon may be the very literal icon of the future. I don't want to run ahead of what God is doing. All I know is we have a culture that is obsessed with images, that is obsessed with itself, that can be easily deceived electronically, and ultimately, he says, it reveals the number of his name. The number is 666. It's not three sixes. People have tried to guess throughout history. Who is it? It's Nero. Now you've got to change the spelling of his name to make it add up that way. It's Charlemagne. It's Napoleon. It's Hitler. It's Stalin. It's uh, some president I didn't vote for. It's somebody I don't like. Uh, whatever. No, you don't want to know who the Antichrist is. You figure out who the Antichrist is, you've been left behind. This is for the people that have been left behind to figure out, wow, this is what's going on. Christ has come through the line of Israel, the woman. Satan is in opposition to the things of Christ. Jesus now is in heaven, ascended to the Father. The heavenly war is taking place between the angels and ultimately on earth. The remnant of her seed are fleeing from persecution. The Antichrist has come to power. The false prophet is assisting him. The world is about to plunge itself into chaos and they're under the mark of the beast because they're under the control of the beast. That's why the message of Bible prophecy is so important and why it's so important that we get it out there. Trust me. You don't want to be left behind. If you are, everything goes wrong. You want to know that when Jesus comes and the archangel shouts and the trumpet sounds, you're ready to go to meet the king when he comes. Because indeed, the king is coming again. The question is, is he coming for you?